Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 480. How is modern medicine treating women? BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moffin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. So we went to this conference a couple weeks ago in Tucson of doctors who practice new age medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are all kinds of names that they use for what they call it because they haven't really agreed yet on, no, on what it is. Mm-hmm. But it's a group of doctors that are beginning to focus on the emphasis of quality of life and preventive medicine, trying mm-hmm. to identify the causes behind the occurrence of illnesses mm-hmm. and correct those causes rather than treat the illnesses specifically themselves. So not be reactive, not just say, oh, so you have a heart attack, so we're gonna treat we're gonna take care of that. Right. We want to catch you before the heart attack. We want to have you do these things or give you these methods of protecting yourself from a heart attack so that you don't have one. Right. So that that's kind of the theory of preventive medicine. They call it functional medicine. They call it age management medicine. I call it age management medicine just because that's there's no better better uh, lingo for that. That age management is basically I'm trying to as you age manage your quality of life you, as you age and, yeah, and the length of healthy. your life. Yeah. So um, in this, there are um, several women lecturers, and this woman was just right on with exactly what I've found in medicine and what I've said. Obviously, before. your experiences, and it was almost like I could have gone experiences. up there and gone, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. uh huh, that's it." Yeah. You know, basically because many of the things in medicine, like the medicines that we give to people, they were never tested on women, and and women are different. We're not just men with a few. And the hormones. dosages were not established for women. No, the dosages are established for men. Yeah. The lab tests for like lipids in general have to do with men, not women, and the danger point of what's dangerous has to do with men, not women. And estrogen makes a big difference in our lipids, so often it doesn't apply to us. So I'm always looking for, when I talk to a man, I talk to him about this. When I talk to a woman, I talk to her about this because I have a different range for women and a different type of discussion because I know that the research was different. Well, in the last five years, it seems to me, as an outsider, mm-hmm. not as a, a medical mm-hmm. practitioner, but there has been a, a resurgent emphasis on the differences between the way women experience heart mm-hmm. attacks and on men, because they used to treat women's heart attacks just like it treated men's heart attacks. And I'll say, finally. And, and, and I'll say, that's finally the truth, because women don't experience heart attacks like men. They don't have the the elephant on the chest kind of feeling, they may feel more like it's 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 regurgitation or some kind of an, a stomach thing. They may not have the terrible pain down their arm. They may have a left-sided migraine or or neck pain. Wow. It's different. And so people would... And doctors didn't know that for a long time. Doctors didn't know that. They observed that in retrospect after they'd send a woman home who was having <laughs> a, heart a, a heart attack and heart then attack. she died. Yeah. And then, or have some kind of terrible crippling... Um, morbidity. So they saw that happen, but they really didn't t- teach doctors that. So they always acted surprised when that happened. So finally, after all these years where we observed that in the ER, you know, I mean, I, I observed it even the, as many years ago when I was an intern. I, wow. I watched that and I went, that's not right. There's, She's not just having indigestion. I mean, this is something more than that. And they'd be like, no, no, it's not a heart attack. <laughs> so, so we heard a presentation by Dr. Angela DeRosa, who is the medical director at Belmar Pharmacy, mm-hmm. which is a pharmacy you work mm-hmm. with. And she titled part of her presentation, Medical War Waged Against Women and Against Hormones. Mm-hmm. And she said there are many things in medicine today that work against mm-hmm. women, against looking at women, understanding them, considering what's going on with them. Excluding us. The, the <laughs> focus is on the more important gender, which is males, mm-hmm. historically. And- True, true. I mean, there's a gender bias in terms of 
Research, for one. They, research, they, yeah. They put women out of most of the medical research for 80 or 90 years because women could get pregnant, and then you could, if you had a woman in a research protocol, you could damage an unborn child. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, let's just exclude all women because women are just like men, and they'll have the same reactions, the same symptoms. Mm -hmm. In the last seven, eight years, more and more mm -hmm. research is beginning to include women in their mm -hmm. research pools or focus on women mm -hmm. specifically. How is a woman different with a heart attack? Mm -hmm. How is a woman different in terms of a dosage of medicine? How does she experience uh, issues and pains? Are there issues and pains that only the woman is going to have, that the man isn't going to have to deal with at all? Mm -hmm. and, and what can we learn about those things? And, lab, and the lab tests that are different for women and men? Yes. Basically, so... Well, and, and a, the, a prime example of that, and that's readily apparent, is to focus on libido and sexual mm -hmm. functioning. For men, as they age, erectile dysfunction becomes a fairly common experience. And there are reasons for that, and medicine was concerned about that because mm -hmm. a man's sexual life is important to society as a whole, and happy men are important to society as a whole. But women can be just, are we aren't supposed to be happy or be sexual, even though, I mean, one, one time I was a medical director, or excuse me, a medical doctor at a, at a Christian camp, and they let the boys wear almost nothing. And it was 100 degrees. And the girls had to wear, like, high necks and sleeves. And they couldn't wear two-piece suits. And the yeah. boys were walking around naked. And they said, and they believed that women were not stimulated by looking at a man. Well, that's just not true. I mean, that's what they believed. And so the women you could, were... You could have told them differently, huh? Uh, yeah, well, I did tell them differently. And they didn't listen to me because it, it was run by a man. Yeah. So, I mean, I just... Basically, I, I saw this and I thought... You know, that was in the 90s, 2000s. I thought, something's got to change. This is ridiculous. But so, that's just one of the things that leads people to believe that sex is not important to women. So Dr. DeRosa says gender bias exists in medicine, and that results in a negative harm to women. Right. She also said that politics, and this sort of, you were talking about religion, but religion and politics have really kind of merged lately mm -hmm. in America. Uh <laughs> And the issue around sexuality and women's sexuality is one of those political topics mm -hmm. that comes up. Should we spend money? For instance, should you know, if, if men need ED medicine, mm -hmm. their or insurance will pay for it. Or testosterone. Or testosterone. Their insurance will pay for it. Mm -hmm. But if a woman, first of all, they don't have a, a libido drug that works for more than 20% of the women. And that, yeah. they've only had that the last year. And I contend that they don't need one because they haven't tested women with testosterone to give them libido. So, right. I mean, there's few tests, but not a lot. And, and so those are not so much medical issues as political issues. Are, are we going to pay for that? Do we think it's important? Is you may it relevant? Not, they may not know. I mean, NIH is paid for by your tax dollars. The FDA is paid for by your tax dollars. Half of the people in America that are working are women. And our tax dollars are paying for all this research on men, but not on us. Right. So it's, it's directed it's the money we put into the pot, and it's directed away from us. So that's one of the things she's talking about. Well, like birth about. control. Right. For years, insurance companies wouldn't pay for that. Mm -hmm. That's true. Because they wouldn't. Well, it was more important to put all the men, the money in the men's pool to pay mm -hmm. for things that they had. Mm -hmm. uh, so another issue that she identified was pharmaceutical companies. She said their efforts are skewed in favor of men. And, and I'm not sure why she thinks that, but she did say it. It's on her list. Uh, is it because she thinks men still are economically dominant in the production field? We talk about wage equity. Mm -hmm. Women don't mm -hmm. make as much money. Because we're home so taking care I'm of So I'm trying to make more money, and mm -hmm. then I want to sell it to somebody that's got the money to pay for it. And men own most of the businesses, and they decide on most of the insurance companies. And do they pay for Viagra? Well, if they do, then the men might sign up for that. And so they, want to, so they have all these Viagra-like drugs, you know, that are approved by the FDA for men. And then just a few for women— and not and testosterone is not one of them because right. they've just accepted now the endocrine society just decided in the last so this is in October of 2019 that women make testosterone and need it for for their sexual well-being. They didn't That's, know that before then. No, I've been doing this 18 years, yeah. and you know they didn't acknowledge it exactly. So now they acknowledge it. So you can't research something if if the a uh, specialty that is in charge of it doesn't believe that it's something. That's a real something. thing, yeah. I mean, the American College of OBGYN is still backward. They don't believe it It even is a woman's hormone. So, so Dr. DeRosa identified these things and, and two or three more, she, which we've sort of already mm -hmm. talked about. Money and the lack of research for mm -hmm. women 
And then she identifies two more, uh, or three more, media and celebrities mm -hmm. and fear. What can you tell us about, well, why was she saying that? Media and celebrities, if, a, if a, either a drug company or somebody in medicine convinces a celebrity that something is true, and the celebrity really doesn't work in it every day, but they're the mouthpiece, they will, because they're celebrity and people know them, they will say, they, they will make people believe them, even though they have no medical knowledge, no scientific knowledge, they don't work in, this, in the field. So they use, they, basically people are used, the celebrities are used to pitch, it's just like it being a mouthpiece for anything. And people will then listen to them and believe they know something about it. Right. When they don't. Or, or that they actually use it themselves when often when they, they don't. don't. Yeah. <laughs> and that's true so, in all, all yeah. advertising, not that's just right. medical advertising. It's just advertising. advertising. Yeah. So they're not really the experts. Right. Suzanne Summers didn't write her own book. She had somebody else write it for her. She worked with her doctor. And her name's on it. Donald Trump didn't write his own book. Right. The we wrote our own book. <laughs> we did write uh, both our books. <laughs> we wrote both our books. <laughs> all right. So, um, so that's that's kind of the difference. You have to see who's who's really the author of the information that you're getting, and and basically, uh, all of these things have made women second class citizens. We still are second class citizens when it comes to drugs being approved by the FDA and being allowed to need sexual medication after our ovaries are gone. Right. It's really. It's. I mean. It's. It's sad. It's a problem. So it's angry making and it's frustrating. So they so, um, so the fear part. Yeah. Fear is how they manage women. So they manage men with data, and you can skew data. What did, what did John always say that? Figures uh, always lie, but liars never figure. Wait, I, liars always liars figure. Liars always figure. Yeah. So if you want to convince somebody a man of something, you give them the data. You give them the the um, whatever kind of data you want to give them. But you can probably make the numbers look like anything you want. So I said that totally wrong. What, what John says, what? what I say regularly, is that uh, figures never lie, but liars always, always figure. figure. So they manipulate the figures. They manipulate the base. They expand or contract the base. I think to you make said it point. right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, liars always lie. Yeah. In any case, to manage women, it worked for the first time. The drug that was paid for was at the very top of the list for Medicare uh, payment was Premarin. So. The, gut, the brilliant people in the think tank said, oh, well, we need to get women afraid of taking Premarin slash estrogen. So they had a study that was, that was structured to, fa to make estrogen fail the test. So even when it didn't quite fail the test, they then played with the numbers to make it look like it failed the test. Well, they spent $700 million. They studied 17,000 women. Uh, 10,000 of whom were not on Premarin. Mm -hmm. The other... 16,000 were on mm -hmm. Primrin. And what they were looking for, the bo bogeyman that they were trying to identify, was the cause of breast cancer. Right. And so they they terrify women with those two words, breast cancer. It's a and scary, they, and deadly the headline. thing. So you should never just read a headline. You have to read below it because the headlines are there to make you read it. And right, and the headlines are not written by the person that wrote the article. The right. headlines are written by the editorial staff. They have a headline writer. And so the and headline said, your eye. said hormones cause breast cancer. And what it turned out to be in the end was that not Premarin, which is estrogen. Premarin, when given alone, made the breast cancer risk, risk was a, a wash. It didn't go up or down. But Premarin, when given with Provera, increased the risk by just a little bit. Provera is a progestin that we give to people with a uterus. So they should have said Provera causes breast cancer or increases the risk of breast cancer. But they didn't. So everybody got afraid of, including doctors who didn't read the study, said, oh, it's dangerous. Don't ever go on estrogen. And that still persists today, even though they've retracted the study and fired the woman who was the head of the NIH uh, research the National Institute for, of Health. There, for this. But there was a rush to judgment. I mean, they, they saw this data coming in about breast cancer that scared them, and they cut it off. And, as, and they said, okay, what we learned from this is don't do hormone replacement therapy. Don't any, and there were millions of women that were on hormone replacement therapy, primarily estrogen, not so much testosterone, mm -hmm. but estrogen, mm -hmm. who were reporting improvements in quality of life, in, improvements in health and satisfaction. But all of a sudden, because of the fear, they couldn't get access to it because the doctors, doctors were told, write it. don't give this to women. It'll cause breast cancer and they'll die. 
because there's no cure for breast cancer at, yeah, there, at this time. Well, there I know was. there are now, but there was then and there too. were then too, but not the st- the numbers have improved greatly. Mm-hmm. The, the five year window, the seven year window, the ten year window, more and more women are living through right. having breast cancer. But it's still a frightening, terrifying verdict. If someone looks at you and says breast cancer, male or female, mm-hmm. you think you're going to die. That's what you hear. Cancer, you feel like you're going to die. But in the end, the WHI study basically was constructed to cause fear in women. And it worked. It made, and in doctors. It, it took Premarin. Well, they had to work through the doctors. But yeah. it took Premarin off the list of the drugs that were high, high expenses for Medicare. So... They could use that money on something that benefited men. Well, and that's not the only time this has happened in medicine. We've mm-hmm. talked about the whole breast cancer scare. We've talked about the WHI study. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was another study that the, NHI, the NIH ran uh, <clears throat> over 10 years ago uh, about mammograms. Right. And doctors at the time were saying m- women should get a mammogram how often? Every year after 40. At least once a year. And so all the way up to, I think, 75 or something when your metabolism slows down and the cancer would be slow and it wouldn't ha- you wouldn't have to look at it every year. So we said once a year, and I made my patients do that. Every right. year I'd give them a, a script for it. But all of a sudden, out of the blue, they came up with a study that was also a bad study that said, oh, you don't need a mammogram every year. You need it every other year. Well, what doctors should do is they should look at their own experience and say, does that make sense to me before they follow any guidelines that come out like that? So I looked at my my patients and I said, well, I have patients that the only patients that had really bad breast cancer, except for one that I can remember, had waited longer than a year for their mammogram. And then we found it late. So if you find it within a year of no breast cancer, breast cancer, it's early and we can get rid of it and people don't die. But the ones that did have severe breast cancer were people that had either never had a mammogram or had waited more than a year and a half. So survival rates for breast cancer are, there's a positive correlation. They should have done a study on that. B- between, <laughs> between early diagnosis right. and late diagnosis. Yeah, they, they do have, a stu- they have lots of studies on that, but right. they don't, but that somehow didn't translate into mammograms. Yeah. So I never took my patients off the yearly schedule for mammograms, and I still haven't. Um, but they all of a sudden, they came back 10 years later saying, we were wrong. People over 40 have to have yearly mammograms so that we can catch them early. And then in the meantime, all these women have died and had terrible breast cancers because they listened to the governmental so there are other agency stakeholders. through their doctors. There are other stakeholders involved in that discussion, though, between the, the doctor and the patient about, I think you should have a mammogram. And then they come out and say, NIH study comes out and says, don't do mammograms that often. They're not necessary. It's, it's a waste of time and money being driven by the insurance companies to say, we don't want to pay for mammograms every year. And some women now have policies and the, and the that don't pay for those. And the government's saying, government. yeah, that makes sense to us. Except that in the state of Missouri, one of the things that, that I wrote up in the legislation I passed in 2001 um, was that insurance in Missouri had to pay for a mammogram every year for women. That was so, part of legislation in this so state. So you were... Uh, involved in the Missouri Medical Society. Yeah. You represented their lobbying arm to the legislature. Mm-hmm. But the, do- I, the lawyers who I aren't went directly doctors, to the governor on that. To the governor? Because they weren't covering, bre- they weren't covering treatment for breast cancer, reconstruction for breast cancer. They, they, they were completely, they completely just didn't, didn't have to cover any of that, and it wasn't right. I mean, honestly, women that had their breasts removed need reconstruction psychologically sure. if they want it, they need it. Yeah. And if they can't afford it, they should still be able to get it. So, right. so I went to the governor with that when he was being, when, um, he was being um, elected and he got elected. And yeah. he, he uh, two months after, or within the month of his election and becoming governor, he instituted this. So the state, and it hasn't been repealed. Okay. So we have a more fair... Uh, kind of legislation in this state than we ha- than other states, but a few other states followed us after that. So, in in Dr. DeRose's presentation, there was a term that she started using and some some data behind the term. And I think I don't know how medical it is, but it's it's a it's a shocking statement, and, mm-hmm. and it gets your attention. You pay mm-hmm. attention to it, uh, and that's what she wants for us to pay attention mm-hmm. to that, especially in reference to women mm-hmm. and the gender bias in medicine about women. And the the term that she used uh, is. Statistical, statistical homicide. Right. So can you help me explain what she means when she's saying that? 
it, it goes along with the, the statistics. You can, you can make anything sound good or bad with the statistics, depending on how you structure it. Right. But um, she said that it meant the triumph over of, of long odds over common sense. Okay. Kind of what we were talking about with mammograms. They, they had a study that showed that that was right, but I knew in reality that it, with my patients, it wasn't right. That's right. common sense. Right. So here's another example of, um, of sunshine, okay? So everybody puts sunscreen all over their body, so now everybody has low vitamin D. Vitamin D is a very important... The sunscreen blocks the absorption block, yeah, the sunscreen of the blocks vitamin D. Yeah, absorption of, of vitamin D. It also blocks uh, the rays of the sun that might damage your skin. So they, So we were all kind of bamboozled by the fact that that um, the, the people in the know told the dermatologist and everybody else that if you don't use sunscreen, you're doubling your chance of getting basal cell carcinoma. Doubling your chances, that sounds bad, right? But if you don't have your sun exposed or skin exposed to the sun, then you're going up by a third, I think is what, what I found, yeah. was going up by a third in heart disease. You need vitamin D from the sun to help your heart stay healthy. And heart disease kills more women every year than skin cancer does. Right. And get what, guess what the risk of skin cancer, they were doubling. 2%. A risk of 2% was doubled to 4% by sunscreen. But you, your risk went up by a third, 33.3%. If For heart disease, if you didn't go out in the sun without sunscreen. So who's right? So this is what she's talking about is is saying statistics like, oh, doubled. Well, if it's a tiny percentage, you double it, it doesn't mean anything. Right. So yeah, if it goes from two to four. And if you have two different risks, and the risk of heart disease is much greater than basal cell carcinoma, basal cell you can just cut out. It doesn't go anywhere. You, you just have to find it early and cut it out. So she says statistical homicide is a clever manipulation of the data to emphasize some statistical point that isn't the major point. And that eventually kills and people. And eventually kills people. And those people, in her argument, her presentation, turn out to be women. Very often they do. Yeah. So that, that's why she said, historically, medicine has been at war against women. And you don't mm -hmm. agree completely with that statement, but so many of the things that she did discuss. I think it's been, you know, there's, there's uh, you can either um, traumatize your children or you can neglect them. I think they've just neglected us. They leave us out. And by leaving us out, they feel they're doing no harm. But neglect is also a bad uh, way of managing children, people, any, anyone, and it does cause death and harm. So neglect is dangerous. And so by neglecting us in all the studies, in all the money, in all the decisions, they are keeping us from being able to be the people that we should be and being able to function and be healthy in, most importantly, I think they've done this with testosterone. I think that testosterone scares them for women because then we'll be able to perform after the age of 45 just as long as they do. Because, you know, at 55, guys can get testosterone when they're starting to lag behind, not be able to think. They get testosterone and they're still running their companies. Women go, oh my God, I can't think. And they can't run their companies and nobody gives them testosterone so they can think. So to me, that's neglect. And that keeps us down. It's just a way of keeping us down. And that's, to me, really dangerous. And it's not for a government to do. I mean, honestly, government shouldn't be involved in this. Your doctor and you should be involved in this. So gender equity and health equity are not uh, mutually disparate concepts. They're right. connected. They are connected. So be aware of that when you discuss these issues with your physician. And be aware of it when people are trying to manipulate you with fear using propaganda techniques to control your decision making. Thank Thanks you for, for listening. listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. 
Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com. <laughs>